Watch more programs like this on cable and stream with PCN Select. Subscribe at PCNTV.com. Hello, I'm Major General George Gordon Meade, and I am the commander of the Union Army of the Potomac at the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm a native of Pennsylvania and of Philadelphia. I am a West Point graduate. I was a 25-year veteran of the United States Army. I was an en in the Engineer Corps of Engineers. Uh, at the beginning of the war, when the volunteer army was created, of course, I was in the regular army. I was a captain in the Corps of Engineers, but the volunteer service was created with 300,000 and 500,000, then a million men, and they needed competent commanders. So I made myself available for the volunteer service, and I was promoted Brigadier General of Pennsylvania Volunteers, commanding a brigade in the second brigade of the Pennsylvania Volunteer Reserve Corps, Pennsylvania Reserves, which is a division entirely composed of Pennsylvanians. And we saw service with that division uh, in the most of the beginning of the war. So I've been around since the beginning, uh, beginnings of the war. So my first major service would have been on the Peninsula Campaign under General McClellan, another Philadelphian, uh, where we attacked uh, Richmond, the Confederate capital, of course, via the peninsula between the York River and the James River. And I saw service there at um, the Battle of Beaver Dam Creek and then uh, uh, in the Peninsula Seven Days Campaign. And the Seven Days Campaign, of course, was composed of seven days in which there was a battle every day. And finally, uh, next to last day of the battle, June 30th, 1862, uh, at uh, what's known as the Glendale, the Battle of Glendale, a very, very vicious and pivotal battle that people don't know about very much, but it could have ended the war right there had the Confederates been successful in driving through us and driving us into the James River. And my troops were sent, and I was ordered to hold that spot, that crossroads at Glendale, Fraser's Farm, at all hazards. And we did that. We fought viciously, eight charges and countercharges, over the guns uh, and uh, uh, dead artillerymen and, and horses until finally, uh, uh, finally a gap opened and I rode to the last reserve regiment and led them into the battle and I was shot and almost killed at that battle. I was shot through the lungs, will impair me and I will have respiratory problems the rest of my life. Uh, I did uh, return home for uh, about uh, 50 days uh, leave. I did recover and I returned in time for the second Bull Run campaign. This is August of 1862 and we were part of the Army of Virginia under General Pope and that resulted of course in the bitter defeat of the second battle of Bull Run. The Confederates call it Second Manassas. After that General Lee was emblazoned, emboldened, excuse me, emboldened to try to invade the North. He'd always planned to do that to win a decisive victory. Uh, McClellan returned to command of the Army of the Potomac. We joined the Army of the Potomac and became uh, part of the First Corps under General Hooker. And we marched to uh, South Mountain where we fought in the gaps and then onto the battlefield at Antietam uh, at uh, Sharpsburg. And that is the bloodiest day in American history up to this date, whatever this date may be, with 24,000 casualties both sides being Americans in one day. Uh, I was uh, commanding the division of the Pennsylvania Reserves in the, in the cornfield, Miller's cornfield, when I received an order placing me in command of the First Corps. Uh, General Hooker had been wounded. Even though I was a junior commander, I was placed in command by General McClellan, showing his regard uh, perhaps for my ability. After that, I returned to command of my division. A new army commander takes charge, General Burnside, and he will embark upon the Fredericksburg campaign. Uh, this will be December 1862, and it will result in a very bitter defeat at the Battle of Fredericksburg, uh, December 13th, 1862. I was in command of the division of the Pennsylvania Reserves on the left flank at Prospect Hill. And apparently through a mix up in orders, uh, I uh, a unit was ordered to assault the Confederate works there in order to uh, have a feint so as to allow our army in town to assault the Maurice Heights and win a victory there. So I was picked, my division was picked to be the suicide charge <laughs> and we charged across the slaughter farm, interesting name, but that was the name of the family. 
And there, lo and behold, we actually break through the Confederate lines. We got in behind Stonewall Jackson's lines and we could um, feel victory. The problem was that no one suspected we would ever be able to do that and therefore there were no reserves to come up and relieve us. And therefore there was no one, uh, one, only one option and that was to retire. And in the course of retiring, with firing front and both flanks, we lost 40% of our men in the Pennsylvania Reserves. After that, uh, there are some consternation and morale problems in the Army and a new commander will take over, Joe Hooker. And Hooker uh, will, in, in January, end of January 1863, I will be promoted to the command because I was a major general at that point, as approved by Congress in the, reserve, in the uh, volunteer corps, volunteer uh, service. And I was uh, raised to the command of the Fifth Corps. In the Army of the Potomac, there were seven infantry corps, a cavalry corps, and an artillery corps, which was called the Artillery Reserve. And uh, so I was leading the Fifth Corps, and some, consider, some people considered the Fifth Corps the best corps in the Army. Why? Not because of me, but because it contained the division of the regulars. All the regular professional soldiers were uh, gathered together in the second division of the fifth corps and I was proud as a regular to be commanding them along with of course the volunteer troops What will ensue is May 1863 where we have the Chancellorsville campaign. This was an attempt by the, our army which outnumbered the Confederates Over two to one almost three to one at that time uh, near near Fredericksburg and we were going to outflank them uh, through the wilderness and then drive their flank, drive them into the city uh, and, and defeat them there, we hoped. That was the hope and the plan. And I was in charge of the Fifth Corps. I was given the uh, burden of ad the advance of the army up 25 miles up the Rappahannock River, then crossing over the Rappahannock, Rapidan, and then coming down through the wilderness and driving the Confederates before me. We, we were doing that very successfully. Not a whole lot of uh, action at that point. We reached the great uh, plateau there where Chancellorsville, it's not a town, it's a, it's, a, it's a building, a large building on the Orange Turnpike. And uh, there I received orders to, um, ho to hold and wait for Hooker. Hooker will arrive. And the next day he orders an assault on the Confederates. They had time, of course, to bring up reserves. And I was driving them nicely on May the 1st, 1863, when I receive an order, pull back, pull back. And I said, why? We're doing well. The plan is working. What's going on? I was sent back and they said, orders con confirmed, pull back. And I came back to Chancellorsville and I came to General Hooker and I said, General Hooker, what's the problem? We were succeeding. We were driving the enemy. We were almost to our goals. What happened? He said, it's suspicious. Lee has something up his sleeve. We must pull back and uh, wait his attack. And so at that point, he had given over, uh, he had lost his nerve and had given over uh, the initiative in the, in the fighting to General Lee. It was a very, very, very bitter defeat. We were forced to cross, recross the Rappahannock River uh, to Falmouth, uh, losing 17,000 casual, casualties, killed, wounded, captured, and missing, of course. So a lot of demoralization. And of course, uh, General Lee is going to take advantage of this demoralization by deciding to reinvade the North. He'd always wanted to do that. He was stopped at Antietam. And that why was he going to invade the North? He wanted a decisive victory on Northern soil. First of all, he could provision himself off the riches of the North, uh, get supplies and so on. But if he could defeat our best army, capture Washington, capture Philadelphia, who knows, it may have resulted in some form of independence for the Confederacy, which we could not allow, of course. So he begins to advance in June. Uh, uh, up the valley, or pardon me, down the valley into the north, and he reaches Pennsylvania by June 27th, 1863. He's loose in this rich farmland. He's subsisting off the ground, off the uh, people, taking supplies in, horses, animals, and no, no Union troops anywhere to be beheld. Some militia forming, but that was it. So at that point, General Hooker is relieved of command for many, many different political reasons. I won't get into that. And uh, that meant that someone, one of the uh, corps commanders, the lieutenants of the, of the army, uh, had to take over because they couldn't call a halt to the, the invasion and then go look, look for somebody else somewhere, somewhere else, such as General Thomas. Uh, he was a thousand miles away in Mississippi. So it had to be someone on the site. And so I was a 
compromise candidate. Uh, general, when I was nominated, no one knew me. I have no political agenda. I just do my duty to the best of my ability. And Lincoln was heard to say, well, Meade should do well on his own dunghill. Dunghill meaning Pennsylvania. Of course, the voters didn't know about that, so they did re-elect him in 1864. So I was promoted, I was ordered to take command at 3 a.m. on the morning of June 28th. I was awakened from my uneasy slumber, my tent outside of Frederick, Maryland, and ordered to take command. I, at first I declined because I didn't think I was capable. And there were better men, such as General Reynolds, who might do a better job. And they said, no, 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 this is an order. You must execute the order. It's a peremptory. And so I said, well, I have never refused a legitimate order. Uh, from uh, higher authorities, therefore I accept, but knowing full well the difficulties and burdens that uh, I, I had assumed. And so I gathered General uh, Reynolds, for example, he met me to congratulate me. I said, don't, con don't congratulate me, you should commiserate with me. <laughs> and I found out that he had actually been offered the command, but had turned it down. At that point, we weren't in the invasion and he had the, uh, you know, the uh, leeway to be able to do that. And uh, I said, John, help me beat these people. And we came up with the plan which will result in the Battle of Gettysburg. I have to give him all the credit uh, for that, uh, uh, su the suggestions, recommendations, and his advice. Uh, and of course, uh, he will be killed on the first day of the battle. Uh, and I will lose not only my best friend, but also one of our greatest leaders and military commanders, and he was killed on July the 1st, 1863, here. So the, what was the plan? Basically it was, we knew that Lee was loose in Pennsylvania, probably a 60, 70 mile front, all the way from the Susquehanna in the east to um, Greensburg in the west, and mountains in between, and what we were going to do, we can't cover all of that ground. So we reasoned that Lee would probably want to stay close to the mountains in case of a, uh, reverse that he could retreat behind the mountains for cover and uh, so but still stay on the eastern side in case he wanted to give battle to our army he found out that we were approaching rapidly in his rear he called all his troops from various sections all the way from Harrisburg to the Susquehanna and in the uh, Cumberland Valley all the way back to consolidate uh, east of the mountains near Cashtown originally uh, initially and so uh, I sent my Cavalry forward as a screen. Some people say I handled the cavalry the best that had ever been handled. And of course, the cavalry had come of age. They had been uh, become the equal of the Confederate cavalry, which was not the case earlier in the war. And I gave General Reynolds one third of my army, three corps, to go forward on the left near the point where we thought they would consolidate and to have a reconnaissance in force. And if he found that ground to be favorable, to stay and fight, and if not, to fall back to a superior defensive position. As he fell back, he would get stronger because he was closer to the reserves and his supplies and so on. And so uh, he went forward, he saw the ground, he chose to fight west and north of the town of Gettysburg, because it's the rolling hills and so on, good defensive positions. And he was placing troops, the Iron Brigade, in line early in the morning, about 10.30 in the morning, when he was shot and killed by a Confederate bullet. And we lost our commander on the field and one of our, my best friend and, my, and a great uh, leader of men in the Union Army. So um, the first day's fight will be a complete Confederate victory. They had more troops closer to the action. They drove our forces back. We solidified south of the town on high ground. And fortunately, I was able to send General Hancock forward to take, kind of make some sense of the chaos. And um, I finally broke camp. I was at Tawnytown, Maryland at the time. And uh, I came up about midnight onto the field of Gettysburg. So I missed the first day's battle, which was a complete Confederate victory. But we were, pen we were tenacious. We wanted to stand and fight. This is our home territory. And so I came forward, reconnoitered the lines, and created the defensive position that will become the famous fish hook line. Thank you very much. I hope that summarizes somewhat all the fighting in the Eastern Theater uh, of, uh, of the Civil War. Thank you.